everybody. This is Pastor Brady Henderson, the senior pastor of the First Baptist Church in Gaston, South Carolina, and I am super excited today for the 36th episode of the Menorah Podcast. And so today is October the 10th, 2024, and Alan, here we are already. This year has gone by quickly as I'm wearing my committed hoodie. This will only be our word of the year for about two and a half more months, and then we'll have another one, and 2025 will be here. Yeah, we're well into the fourth quarter of this year, and uh, we'll be looking at beginning a new year in just a few months. It's hard to believe. Absolutely. Crazy to believe, but uh, it's been a great year. God's done a lot of great things. So today on the 36th episode of the Menorah Podcast, I hope for the last two weeks you've enjoyed Charles Burton, and uh, I know we enjoyed interviewing him, and so hope you guys enjoyed that. So I want to kind of let you know where we're heading on the podcast for the next few weeks, and then kind of how we're going to wrap up the year and some things of that nature. So today uh, on the 36th episode, uh, Alan and I are going to review 1 Samuel chapters 1 through 15. Alan is going to interview me. Those of you know that since we're 25% of the way through our series in 1 Samuel, I felt led to make my sermon notes into a digital commentary. So he's going to interview me on the commentary, how that came about, what it's like to put all that together writing sermons and all of that. And then next week on October 17th, it is my mother's birthday, so go ahead and get ready. Uh, I'd love for you to text her next week uh, on her birthday. I'll give you the phone number for that. She, she'll she get a kick out of that. But uh, anyway, October 17th, we're going to talk about Pastor Appreciation Month, and Alan is going to interview me on what I want from Pastor Appreciation Month, and it is not what you think. So looking forward to that. And then on October 24th, on episode 38, uh, I'm going to issue several warnings for believers concerning Halloween. We'll give you some of those and, and talk a little bit about that. So that's kind of where we're headed. But for today, we're going to look at episode 36, review of 1 Samuel chapters 1 through 15. And Alan, let me catch those up that, that have no idea. Uh, in January of this year, um, we started going verse by verse through 1 Samuel. Right now, we're 29 sermons in, 25% of the way through First and Second Samuel. So for those that don't know, in the Hebrew text, in the Hebrew Bible, there is no First and Second Samuel, there's Samuel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so later on, it became First and Second Samuel, which I totally agree, because First Samuel is separated in chapter 31 with chapter 1 of Second Samuel, where Saul commits suicide, and so Saul is, is, is no more. And so it picks, Second Samuel picks up a lot more with David. And so we'll get to that whenever we get there. But uh, And by the way, just to let our church know, it's probably going to be a few years until we're able to finally get out of Samuel and then probably move into Kings then because it just makes sense biblically to move to that. But uh, that's kind of where we're going. But when you understand Samuel, it does give you a better understanding of the historical part of the Old Testament, specifically with Israel and all of that. So before you ask me questions about the commentary, what it's been like preaching through 1 Samuel, first 15 chapters, I want to ask you, Alan, as a congregation member, as a listener, you know, what have, what have what's kind of that overarching thing that you've gotten the first 15 chapters into our study? Well, I think, you know, I, when we started this and, and we were discussing your projection for maybe where you were going. Uh, I told you that I really enjoyed First and Second Samuel because it is kind of a historical background piece, so to speak. And but there's a lot of stuff in there that we don't really think about. There's a a lot of different viewpoints in there that we don't really think about. That a lot of times uh, we're seeing as we go through it verse by verse by verse. You know, typically uh, messages coming from a historical perspective is to give you background on something else. Mm-hmm. But as we go into this, the, the smaller nuances of the interactions between the nation of Israel and God mm-hmm. and how they how they reacted with each other. And it kind of really sheds a light on where we are today. And, and, and we look back and it's it's like. We say, you know, look like these guys are would at least listen to what God's saying, but we're in the same boat. You oh, know, yeah. it's it's the same things are happening today that happened then, and you can see 
uh, how we've gotten in the mess that we're in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the commentary, Alan. I am I am all ears. You you ask me and I'll be honest and hopefully our listeners uh, will gain a little bit of insight into this. Uh, I will say as a disclaimer, sermons don't write themselves. So if when you text me and you haven't heard from me in a in a while or something of that nature, nine times out of ten I'm usually in the study. So there's a little disclaimer on that. Yeah, and you know we I think most everybody is uh is pretty used to that. And another thing I'd like to to mention is if you did not get uh get the email with this, uh, let the church office know and yes, we'll yes. get it forwarded out to you. And as we add on to it, we will uh, probably update it at some point. So yes. uh, just keep that in mind. But first of all, I, I would like to know what led you to the thought of writing a commentary. Good question. That's <laughs> you, you did not start off with a softball. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think for me, uh, as somebody that reads commentaries all week long, and not just commentaries, but articles, journals, things of that nature. I think for me personally, it comes from a place, number one, of wanting to help people. I do not think I'm a scholar. I'm not. I do not think I'm a theologian. I'm not. I don't think I'm any of those things. I'm just simply a student of God's Word. And so for me personally, I want to help people better understand. And I think what's lacking in the world of scholarship today are deep, exegetical commentaries that the common person can understand. So what I mean by that is somebody that cannot read Hebrew, they still need to know what the Hebrew word means. Just because they can't read it doesn't mean you need to leave it out completely. Dale Ralph Davis has a great commentary on 1 Samuel. It's great commentary. A lot of guys have it on their shelves, but it's a lot of stories. It's a lot of illustrations. It's a lot of things of that nature. And I'm not saying stories and illustrations are bad. Please don't hear that. But what I'm saying is you can't throw out the meat when you're writing a commentary just because you don't think somebody can handle it. And so in this 250-page commentary, this is just the first 15 chapters. And to kind of share my vision, you know, I do plan, uh, after we finish 1 Samuel, I do plan on taking this to a publisher and saying, do with do what you can do. Because these are sermon notes, so they might have to change it around and switch it up. And then 2 Samuel, when we get there, I'll do the same thing. And so I think for me personally, I wanted to do it because, number one, I love our people. I love God's people, and I want them to be able to have something that when they're teaching Sunday school, they can pull it up and say, okay, this makes sense. It's written in a sermon. I can pull these teaching points. I've got the Hebrew right in front of me and explains everything about that word. To where I don't have to have all of these expensive tools. I've got those as pastor. I've got those. I'm working through the weeds so that you can get a better product is what I'm trying to give you. And so um, just to give an example, you know, my wife teaches Sunday school here at First Baptist. She teaches the youth. They're on a rotation. And so she teaches the youth. And whenever she teaches, she comes to me. She came to me last night. And so we're recording this on a Tuesday. She came to me on a Monday night and said, hey, I'm teaching on Genesis chapter 4, Cain killed Abel, what do you have on it? And all my sermon notes are on a Google Doc. And so what she'll do is she will go on there and type in her text. And if I've preached that text before, she has commentary on that. And so this is coming from her. She has said that it is a lot easier for her to understand it because she knows me, she knows my voice, she knows what I'm trying to say, and so it's a lot easier for our people to be able to understand if they've got it written down. So that's kind of why I wanted to do that. I also wanted to do that for another reason, because what I preach, in other words, I don't, I mean, I have my notes up there as a guide, Mm -hmm. but there's a lot that the Holy Spirit brings out that aren't in the notes, and so I might have, you know, I might have these notes only I would say 30% of what's in the notes the congregation never hears. And so they can go back, they can read it, they can look at it. But really it's it's for study if they were to ever teach 1 Samuel. And, and, And I think it has a lot to do with this. You know, my vision is that, and I'm just using this family as an example, but my vision is that Troy and Savannah would take this commentary link, print it out at home, have it at home, put it on their shelf at home, and one day, long time from now, when Hunter is... 50-something years old and teaches Sunday school, he knows that at mom and dad's house, 
that his childhood pastor wrote a commentary on First and Second Samuel so he can pull that out and look at it and teach a lesson if God were to call him to do that. And so I think it's to guide people, to give people assistance. And, and I think it has one reason. Or th- I have three reasons that I did it written in the first page of the commentary. I'm taking a long time to answer this question. But number one, Samuel is a hard book to understand. If you look at the Hebrew Masoretic text, or he, yeah, Hebrew Masoretic text, it is almost impossible to translate. It is extremely difficult. I won't tell you the amount of time I have spent translating the Hebrew and consulting other scholars scholars i'm not a scholar other scholars and so it's very difficult uh also it, samuel confronts cultural issues that make us uncomfortable and one thing that i think god has led me to do as a preacher is be bold with his word and a lot of commentators for lack of a better term shy away from that in their commentaries they don't want anything written down that would go against the culture that, right, they, that right. they could get themselves well, on a platter it's always easier to hear you might want to do that a little differently than you did that wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and then the other reason is I have found there's not a tons of commentaries out there on First Samuel that are very helpful. And that's just kind of my opinion. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying they're not as helpful as they could be. So that's a long, really long answer of why I did this. Well, that's that's important to know. That's a lot of background to know. It kind of gives us gives us an idea of where you're coming from, how you were called to do this. How do you find, uh, you know, you said that these are your, your, basically your sermon notes. Um, So it, it kind of dovetails in how you prepare for your messages. Do you think that you prepare any different now, knowing that you're going to compile this? No, not at all. No, for me, uh, the way I write my sermon notes, I write them as if they're commentary. That's my nature. I, I try to write my sermon notes. My wife tells me I write them as if I'm, I'm speaking them, and that's true. <laughs> a few weeks ago in the study, Beamer was in there with me, and, man, it really starts messing with his head whenever he's with Dad and Dad's working on a sermon because I talk through the sermon. And right. so I talk through it as I study, and he popped his head up and came over there as if, are you talking to me? Like, what's going on here? Are you talking to me? And I said, no, buddy, I'm not. I'm I'm talking with the Lord. I'm trying to walk through this, you know. And so I, I think, you know, I don't change it any differently. And here's the other thing I don't change. And God has blessed me with many opportunities to preach at other churches, which I love. But I, I keep saying this, and I wish our congregation would know how true it is and how much I mean this. There is nowhere like this church to preach at. And so the same thing is true when you're writing a sermon. So when I write a sermon, because I pastor this church, there are some certain things I will pull out of the text that apply to our church, where we are right now, that won't apply to somewhere else. Right. And so the commentary is a little bit, it is more pastoral than scholarship because I add that part. Uh, because you can read some of these notes and it says, you know, church, we are going through something like this, or we've gone through something like this, or we might encounter this. It's very pastoral in nature. Because I think that's the best way you can be a pastor is to use the word of God to guide the people through what they're going through. Well, I think that will, I think that will personally make it uh, more, more usable Absolutely. for us as a congregation, um, more so probably than a general population. Yeah, but at the same time, I try not to sacrifice the exegetical depth. There's still ex- exegetical depth in there that a pastor or somebody could look at and say, oh, that's what that Hebrew word means. Oh, okay, that's that's what this is saying, you know, that kind of thing. And like I said, the narratives in First Samuel are so bizarre. I mean, we <laughs> there are so many things that happen. I mean, for example, Saul runs off and chases a bunch of donkeys. They finally find him, and he's hiding behind baggage. There's just so many things. And then as we get through it, you know, we've got a shepherd boy who beca- is anointed king, and now the other guy wants to kill him, and then they go through this whole thing. And then all of a sudden, Saul goes up to a witch and says, tell me the future. And we're like, whoa, well, you know, especially as Baptist, what in the world is going on here? And then he you know, kills himself. So I really don't understand why somebody with Netflix, and if somebody from Netflix is listening to this, I better get royalties, why somebody from Netflix or a or a movie company have not made a series about first and second Samuel. It would be prime time movie content. Yep. And it's in the scripture. 
So what other questions do you have on the commentary? Well, I, there is so many questions that come to mind. You know, did you find this, as, as you wrote this, uh, did you find it easier uh, once you get started? So it's 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 continual. Yeah, you, you mean know, like you, the sermons themselves? Yeah, you start with verse one and you you basically rip yeah. through in order. Does is that help you in writing? Oh yeah, um, yeah. It's it's wonderful, especially when you're in my because there's a lot of pastors that only preach one sermon a week. I mean, they have staff that do Wednesdays and and all that kind of stuff, or or Wednesdays become just small groups or whatever. So. Sundays for a lot of guys are their only sermon. Well, that's great. I do too. It is so much easier when I come to the study. I know what verse I have. I don't know how far I'm going to get that day. <laughs> Later today, I'm going to be in Mark. I want to get through a certain amount of verses. That might not happen, but I want to. And so, you know, I know where I was last week. I know where I'm going to be next week. And I know my task for this week. And so, it makes it a lot easier. It, it makes it a lot easier, and especially with writing, uh, it makes it a lot easier. Obviously, I'm human, so I'm going to have favorite passages. I'm, and, and since I read through First and Second Samuel about 30 times before we got into the series, so I know what's coming. And so that does make it difficult. Because there are passages where I'm like, yes, I get to preach about Samuel uh, here in the call of God. And then next week I'm like, oh, no, I got to preach about Hophni and Phinehas and how they were disrespectful and, and all those different things. So I do think that's important. But I also think it's really rare in the pulpit because I know a lot of guys that have preached through First Samuel and Second Samuel. When I ask them, they're like, oh, I preached through it. And I'm like, well, how many sermons did you do? They're like 15, 16. I'm like, how in the world did you get through all that in 15 sermons? And the answer that comes up is, oh, well, I chose certain narratives. So when a lot of guys will do series on First and Second Samuel, they will pick the narratives that they want and not do every verse. So that's what's different about our study is that we are not leaving a verse out. Because it's very easy to go through 1 Samuel and say, okay, I'm going to pick the story about Saul and the donkeys. I'm going to pick a story about David and Goliath. I'm going to pick a story about David and the anointing. I'm going to pick the story about David and Bathsheba. I'm going to pick all these different stories. But I'm going to leave some of these out because they're impossible, especially if you if you study Hebrew in your sermon prep and you have to read the Masoretic text. It is a nightmare. Well, I think you'll see, too, that as as we have gone through uh, this not that we've we've really gotten very far into it, but I think you'll agree that as we look back over the message that is messages that we've heard, they've been pretty timely. Oh yeah. Even the ones that are not fun to preach are, you know, they spoke to a specific need at a specific time. Well, and it's it's so crazy that you mentioned that, Alan, because that's the number one question that I get concerning expository preaching, planning your preaching. The number one question I get, well, when you plan that far in advance, how do you know that's what God wants? And my response is the Holy Spirit leads me to a book, and then the Holy Spirit leads me with how many verses we're going to have on that day. And that can change. It has changed. But God's always on time with that. I, I, I'm a true believer that our God is big enough to work 16 months in advance, just like he can 16 minutes in advance. The main thing, the main reason people don't like to plan it is because they don't like to take the time. They don't like to prepare. And we have become a culture, now I'm preaching, we have become a culture and a society where we love to fly by the seam of our pants, and that is not biblical, in my opinion, most of the time. Not all the time, most of the time. Well, I, I, I tend to agree with you a lot of times, and, and I think part of that comes from a complicated lifestyle. Yes. You know, we've packed so much stuff that, that we feel like is important, and I think one thing that we've, you know, we've kind of done ourselves a disservice by being so busy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Bible says, be still and know I am God. And it's very and, interesting, by the way, that Hebrew word we just studied in our study in Samuel. So that Hebrew word for be, that is translated be still literally means not to have any bodily movement. Literally, to have no bodily movement. And that's pretty difficult. <laughs> and, and by the way, that Hebrew, to take it a step further, any bodily movement that you can control, 
you're going to have bodily movement at all times because God is allowing your body to move so you can be still trusting that he's making the parts within your body that need to move, move. But the parts that you can control, you be still and let him be God. Boom. That's yep. a really important Hebrew word. Sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> I had to throw that in there. That's the good part of the series, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and again, that's that's something we don't really think about coming out of 1 Samuel. Exactly. Samuel. Those are those are the things that uh, those are the deeper things that uh, that we gain by going through verse by verse, yeah. as opposed to uh, just kind of winging it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, man. We've uh, we've definitely talked a lot about this, so you can access this. Let us know. Uh, the The PDF document is too big to put on our uh, website. But if you would like to look at this digital commentary, uh, you are welcome to. Please call the church office at 803-794-0377. Talk with Miss Velvet. Uh, ask her or give her your email, and then she'll give it to me, and I will send this to you. And if you'd like to be added to the email list uh, that I send out every week, several times a week, uh, please let her know that as well, and we will make sure that you are added to that. So thank you guys so much for listening to the 36th episode of the Menorah Podcast. Today is Thursday, October the 10th. It has been a great time being with you. Let me remind you, the Menorah Podcast seeks to share the light, speak the light, and send the light of Jesus Christ all across the airwaves of the internet. I hope you have a great Thursday. Hope you have a great weekend. And for those that root for the Garnet and Black, go Gamecocks. We'll see you Sunday. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye.